Okay, now we come to the hand gouging. Uh, the gouging machine is really very important to me. Uh, we have two ways of gouging. Our first one is our parallel gouge. We have a concentric gouge, you know, the crescent moon. Um, I use the, the concentric gouge, and the reason for that is the sides of the reed, I like to be closer to the bark because it gives the sides more strength to open up. The critical factor in making a reed is how the reed opens back up, not how it really closes. It can't be stuffy, it can't be hard, the tip can't be sluggish, but uh, the reed has to open back up quickly to have the flexibility that you need. So the question is, is what rate of taper is that? Uh, that can be kind of experimented on. Um, I use about, I think, from the center to about halfway across is I, I come down about 10 or 12 uh, hundredths of a millimeter. Uh, but I, this, 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 this particular gouger, I can move, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, uh, these stands in and out, which places the blade a little off center. You'd want to place the cane in the center. Now, as you see, as, as the blade falls into the cane, it's just going to be small strips. I have this set up to only take off about eight hundredths of a millimeter. If I find that I get over 10, my gouge it gets irregular. And this is wet? Hmm? You do this wet? Yes, I do it wet. Because I want the flexibility in the cane. the cane is not going to flex out. And that's another reason I do a very thin cut is so that we'll push the cane down. Uh, especially when the radius varies on each piece. So that's really all the gouging I do with my hand gouger. Uh, I don't do a lot. Most of it is done in pre-gouging. Now my gouge thickness is somewhere around, you know, 1.45 millimeters, which is 4.57 right there, 4.45 four, four, right there. Uh, and this uh, is another time when I take my hardness meter and I do what I call a wet hardness at the center of my gouge. Can you, the, can you angle it towards this? Yeah, yeah the, the way these meters work is they're spring loaded and you kind of just put it firm there and then you press this down, engages a spring, and the, the, the needle floats. Okay. So, second. I'm just going to focus on it. If, if, if you can kind of look, uh, we probably jumped somewhere around 12 there. I can even go a little bit off the side to see where it is thinner. And if I say that's between three and four, if this it's stopping about 70, 73-ish, uh, for uh, it's coming in around 10. That's what I'm looking for uh, on this particular machine. Every machine does not measure the same. The spring tension cannot be regulated that carefully. So you'll have to determine your own numbers. Now that we've gouged the cane, the one thing I do like to do before I go any further 
and that is take some 600 wet dry and just sand the inside of the reed help close the grains help smooth them out this is about the only time I do this but you get a nice smooth reed yeah. grains look halfway decent there's a couple of large grains in here but they look halfway decent the next step is profiling I love to use machinery uh, this is a double cam machine it has a cam and a cam this cam has been filed out to get the tapers and sides that I kind of want, although I'll be honest and say that I love to be able to fiddle with each reed. Um, each reed plays different depending upon the cane, so one must be very, uh, you know, don't get them too thin. you got to have something to work with. Uh, to use a single cam or a double cam, I don't think it makes that much difference as long as you're set up to get, you know, some decent measurements. This machine uh, is a prototype machine that I inherited. And uh, so it's, uh, if I didn't put this little rubber washer on, I would have a lot of slop. So what I do is I put this rubber washer on and now it, there's no slop so I get uh, you know my shoulders and everything in the right area uh, you bridge the two cams and so when you turn one this one turns so as you cut you, know, you get the pattern on each side again I have this set so it takes off about the same amount. It doesn't take off a lot of cane. Uh, there's only a small gap in the way the blade is adjusted. Uh, it takes a bit of pressure to get through the bark. But then after you get through the bark on one side, you got to keep it clean, otherwise it, it doesn't cut well. You need to swap this around and take the bark off the other side. Always start at the side, just come straight forward. You can see how that just cut that off. Then you just turn this a little bit, do your net turn. You need to create your shoulder. Don't just slide. You, you need to push down and create that shoulder. And if you do very small, you know, slices, narrow slices, uh, you'll have better luck. Don't try and, you know, start in the middle and take a, a, a wide piece. What happens is that when you start getting thin, you're going to bump up on this side. You're bringing a little bit towards us. As you get thin, you get to this side, it bumps up, and you're going to get a bump here. So you do need to turn this as often as you can okay. within reason. Can you hold on a second. <coughs> we are okay. <coughs> you can see we're still into the bark back here more of this will come out but now that we've turned it over, we can start the other side. You can see I can do this several times here and just leave the cane in one place. Turn it just a little bit, do it a few times. I'm not trying to gouge the cane. It's only going to take off a predetermined amount. Pressing harder does not make it 
take off more cane. It just makes things worse. So the only pressure is for the uh, for the co uh, collar. Is really yes. The only yeah. Okay. You have to have pressure to take the cane off. There has to be a consistent pressure, but you don't, you know, have to overdo it. You just need to cut the cane. As long as you're cutting the cane, it's enough pressure. Yeah, I'm really grabbing a lot out of the back before where it just kind of didn't take it. And if I go over the same spot, it will, you know, even it out. It'll, it'll conform to the cam. And I can take a file and kind of take all the extra off. There's some grains in here that have me a little concerned. You can rotate this as many times as you like uh, just to make sure that you, know, you get your, your tip area down as thin as you would like. With this style of reed, the tip area is going to be heavy because of the V that I put in the tip. That is one reason I had to kind of do my own custom cam pattern. Yeah, there's a couple of funny grains in here, but we'll go ahead with this because I have other reeds that uh, I'll, I'll actually be making. Okay, so that is profiling. Uh, when we're starting to learn reed making, until you, you know, really have the cash to go out and buy all the expensive equipment, a lot of times we start making our own reeds, uh, you know, with the cane already processed to a certain point. Some, many of us do buy it like this. This is the way I started when I started making reeds, was by cane that was gouged, shaped, and profiled. Uh, I also just brought it shaped and gouged without the profile so I could also do a little more experimenting. Uh, but as time went on, I was able to you know, get the machinery and make life a lot easier for myself. Now, the reason I selected to go a little bit wider into the tube area was because I like to bevel uh, more than most uh, people. So what I do in my initial beveling, I bevel twice. The first time... Okay, hold on a second, I'm trying to get you know, the focus. The, the first time I bevel, I'm just going to take off the point of the cane right here. I kind of start in the back, and then I slowly move forward. This is where it gets a, a little bit you know, strange to a lot of people. And you're but using a file. I use a file that. right now. This is a Swiss number two equalizing file. It is a Grill Bay file. Uh, then I do the same thing over here. Support the cane with your finger and then move it and then as you're up I'm a little flatter here as I come down I'm a little more at an angle so it changes I'm basically just interested in getting the point off why I want to do that is so that when I fold the cane over and form the tube I have a real issue with reeds that slip where the blades slip back and forth on top of each other, I hate it. So beveling up this high will make a flat area for the blades to sit on. They won't go this way or this way or, or whichever way. They will sit on top of each other and sit and stay. So I don't end up with blades doing this. The problem is 
when you start beveling up in this area, you are going to narrow the, your, your throat diameter. Once you narrow that throat diameter, you're going to go sharper than you can possibly believe. So you have to be careful. More pitch is determined in your throat area than the length of the blade. So if you don't bevel on my particular shape, if you don't take some of this off, you're, you're going to be flat. Okay, so then at that point we score the reed. Now this is a whole other <coughs> area which I'm a little bit weird. This is one inch PVC available at any hardware store. You blocked it by your hand there. Uh, and when I score, I, use, I just use a, a single edge razor blade. I move the cane up. I use, I have to, I use my fingers to draw the, the, uh, the, the razor blade. So if I did it here, I'd fall off. But I'd like to control the depth. And I start right behind the, the, the collar. And if you see the angle of the razor blade is, we've got a 45 degree angle there. And then I just hold that depth coming all the way down. I put in approximately six scoring lines equally placed on the side of the center of the reed. I do not put one down the center because that makes a weak point at the strongest point in the cane because this is a crescent shape. It's very thick in the center. And if it cracks down the center, it will, you know, come down beyond the collar. Generally, if the cane cracks down the center, it's generally because the cane is too hard. But again, you may like harder cane. You, know, you may like softer cane. Everyone is different, depending on what they're after. Okay, so there's six scoring lines, six scoring lines, and as you see, I took them from right in back of the collar. Hopefully, if all these, the, 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 the razor blade went to the same thickness all through here, when the tube forms, it should be very nice and even. It shouldn't be have a point over here, or it should be very, uh, very consistent. That's one of the hardest aspects, is, are the scoring aspect. I wish I had a little machine that did that. I've seen machines, but I haven't found one I like yet. Now, how deep do you go in just to break the mark? Okay. If you if you look at a razor blade where it's honed, I go that deep. And I, that's how I, I judge my, my distance. I just keep it that thickness all the way down the reed. Sometimes I will go through at the end. Uh, I don't think it's necessary as long as you know you cut the cane. <clears throat> then the next thing is folding the cane. Always keep your cane wet. Bending the reeds is a little more difficult because I have so much cane here. It's not, you know, down as far as some uh, profiling machines will allow you to go. So there's a couple of ways you can do it. You could take it and lay it on here. The, the cane is 120 millimeters long. You can put this end at 60, push it flat, bend it over. You've got your little notches here. You can put your notches there, bend it over. Does it guarantee that the ends will match? No, it doesn't. But, uh, you know, it gives you a good shot. Uh, so we'll try it, uh, you know, putting the end on on 60 and then just bending that over. Once you bend it at a right angle, it's bent. Now, how close did we get? Wow, this is a shame. This is is virtually right on. This, this side here is just a tad shorter. So what I might do is put my ruler there, move the cane up a little bit, and just push it a bit that way and that should allow it to line up. It is incredibly important that these two line up because that makes sure that your shape is going to be uniform on both sides. If, the, if this was up higher, our shape would not be sitting on top of the exact 
portion of the cane on the other side. And now what I do is I take a, a piece of, this is braided nylon plumb line that I get at my hardware store and I use it over and over and over and over. It doesn't unravel. It's nylon. Why do I wet it? It seems to give it a little more stretch. And uh, when it dries, if I wrap it on quite tight, and I, I go up to the collar, then I just come right back down, doing it very evenly. I leave a little bit of the cane exposed, come back up a little bit, put your little hitch knot in there and, uh, and pull it tight. And it's tight. You cannot move these uh, threads at all. Now, the next thing is you don't need anything special to open these up. This is, if you can find yourself some miniature lineman pliers, uh, these are great. Uh, I know there's a couple of companies that make them, uh, but uh, the biggest issue is when you're dealing with soon reads is the space at the end because you've got to grab the wires. And if the nippers, you know, close and you still got space here, then that's an issue. But you just kind of, you can kind of open the read up a little bit there and there. And I don't, not too much, just to get the, the mandrel in. Do you go as far as the collar? As you reach not the yet. Okay. No, I do not go as far as the collar, just the back end of the reed. <clears throat> now, my particular mandrel tips, I make myself to my own taper. The reason I do it, because of the shaper. What I, I look for, what I'm wondering is, if this is the right one, I may be on the wrong one. I, I, I've got one in there that's a little bit, well, it's a little narrow. So, how far do we put it in? We only put it in as far as it takes to open up the seam slightly. If you ha uh, have a, a, a mandrel handle that allows you to lock the tip in so that you can you know, retorque the reed so that when the reed dries it straight, that's uh, a good thing. Uh, our, our sides right where the seam is are just slightly open. And if I was to look into the light, the tip of the mandrel should really not go past the shoulder. If you have mandrels that go in too far, they're liable to split your cane. As right now, you can look and see that the, uh, the throat of the reed is slightly open, but there's no splits, and it's a very moderate, it's not round. That's, why I, that's how I like my reeds to dry. And I release this, take them out, and then I let them set for when I get around to making them. To be honest, it could be a day, it could be two months. Like Julia Childs, I just pulled my cake out of the oven. This is reed's been drying for a few days. Uh, if you'll notice, I have pencil markings uh, on my reeds. Generally, there's initials for where I got the cane. And then there's a, an A, B, C, D, E, and that is which tube it came out of. Because uh, if there are four reeds, there'll be four A's, there'll be four B's, four C's. If I get a great read on, on number A, I know, hey, let's go back to that uh, uh, you know, tube and let's see if we can get some more good reads. But now, this has been dry, we just, uh, you can take the mandrel out. You can just pull the string off. This is another little quirky thing that I do with my reeds. 
and that is I take a, a, a nail file, uh, kind of a medium, it's not fine, but what I do is I smooth out where I beveled the reed. I'm not flat. I'm on this side, close side, I'm up a little bit. On this side, I'm down a little bit. And as you see, I draw it clear up in here. But just a bit. There's, again, more off in the back than at the throat. But what I'm after is when this closes, since the reed dried in a good form, that's what I'm after. No stress at all. When I put the wires on, it's not going to be closing anything or, or you know, closing any gaps. It's just going to be the, the reed uh, in its normal state. Uh, brass wire, uh, 22 gauge soft brass wire. Uh, it's pretty standard. I do three wires because I do do I, I put a turban on the reeds. I like to do turbans. I, as far as putting on the wires, I don't do anything fancy. I find if I put on the bottom wire first, you you, you want to press these down, and then grab them in the center and twist. They stay down, and that gives you a good splice. And you, depending on how big of a turban you want to put on, that will determine how far down your 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 wire goes to the bottom of the reed. So you don't have a specific measurement for No, that. I don't. However, if you choose not to use a turban, you must put a wire on very close to the end of the reed. So when you put it on your bulk, it doesn't flare out. What you'll do is bring this wire down and put a second one up a little higher between your second and last wires. That's okay too. I you know I don't have any issues with it with any aspect of it. Once we get this wire on and it's snug, uh, then we can go ahead and put the other wires on. I like to put the top wire on first. <clears throat> You'll notice something is I, I twist my wires left-handed for some reason. I don't know why, I just do. Uh, so I, t I, I, I turn these counterclockwise. There's no rhyme or reason for it. Whatever's comfortable. The top wire goes right in back of the collar. Then I backed it off about an eighth turn and I take and I wiggle it and push it in so that I have have a slight looseness in the wire. We do not want this first wire to stop the vibrations from the reed. The way to solve that one way would be to put the wire back further. Uh, but in my particular case, I, I tend to tune my reeds from the second wire, which is tight. We get into a whole philosophy of reed making here and how you want to do it. Uh, the, this wire goes a quarter of an inch or six millimeters in back of the first wire. Those are the critical wires. Different people do different things. I, I've kind of I've been wanting to do a video like this for a number of years. I was encouraged by a lot of people to do it because of the, the, the read style. Uh, and now things are coming to fruition here, and uh, but that's what we get. We have our three wires. Now we can put on a turban. Now 
Uh, we have all kinds of threads we can use. I don't really care what you use. My preference is to a nylon wire. It has some stretch. If I put on a little snug, it will swell with the cane as it dries and gets wet. Um, it's a lot of fun to have all the different variegated colors. I always find that my younger students love fancy reeds and they keep really good care of them when they look good. Otherwise, you know, they tend to get bumped and, and bruised and cracked. Okay, so since I'm going to use a little bit of tension on the reed, you can either wet the mandrel in water, you can lick it, or whatever, and you put the, the reed on tight because you're going to put some tension on the string. This is some old double F red, white, and blue nylon from Rice, which is no longer in business, but I do like to, to use the thread. It makes really fun reeds. We'll feel patriotic here today. I like to double thread. You can kind of choose your colors as they come down the reed, and it makes really a neat turban. I just grab the loop on the first wire, go once around, cross over, once around, I'm ready to go. Now, you need to grab and pull up. In other words, you need to create a shoulder. Go halfway around, grab and come down. Go beyond, grab, come up, go over, grab, and come down. Go halfway around, beyond, and come up, grab, and come up. Grab and go down. Grab and come up. Don't go straight. You've got to grab it and bring it down. You don't want it to slip, but you're creating a shoulder. Now, at this point here, you can see that we've done a complete circle and we've got a great shoulder going. So now we just continue to do the same thing. Grab, up, oh, see there's a slip there, oops, there's a second slip. So we go back and redo that. I think I've really kind of lost my shoulder a little bit there. We'll try and put it back in. And at some point you go, okay, the turbine's big enough. And um, you, I, I go once around the bottom. Find that place where I ended last time. And come up. And then I, I come up. What I do is I go uh, put about four turns in. Pull and then go around and compress it down. Put in another four. And compress. Then we make a, uh, a loop. You turn it in and around on itself. Uh, a little hard to do. I've got one short thread right there, but I'm going to take and bring that around by hand and, and, and stick it in like that. I need to get this over that wire, and I need to get this over that wire like that and then we pull them tight then just kind of move all these little threads up and we can just kind of pull them especially that one the long one to get the short one and pull it in and that's pretty good if if we we can kind of wander it around and put the cut underneath this wire if we want we don't need to. This is pretty good. Get yourself a sharp razor blade and just we don't want to cut into the I 
that's weird. Why is not it cutting? There it goes. It's a very sharp blade. It was brand new. Okay, then I loosen it on the mandrel. And then one of the standard procedures that most people do is Duco cement. I do like Duco cement. I guess you can use clear nail polish. You can use colored nail polish. You can find other glues uh, that work. I tend to put it on pretty thick. Sometimes it drips, so I always put a piece of paper underneath. Now what will happen will be this will start to soak into the thread and get a skin on it and then I can just take it and I just put it you know, in the, in the, in the holder and let it dry. I'll turn it for a while. If you're in a real rush, you can just, uh, you know, put it in the holder and let the, let the glue grip and cut the excess off. Just make sure you have the entire thing covered. And it's, like I say, it's, it's, it's pretty thick. If I, if I didn't turn it, it would drip off. But I didn't spill any, so that's okay. Don't do it over your new blue jeans or on your mother's carpet. And depending upon heat and humidity, you know, it it can you, you know you can if you can stand the smell, you don't feel like you're getting poisoned. You could probably you know start working on the reed in an hour, hour and a half, maybe two hours. Uh, I tend to leave them at least dry overnight. Sometimes I do use a incandescent lamp to with the heat to dry them a little faster if I'm in a real rush. I try not to ever be in a rush making reeds because you're too apt to make a mistake. The other thing is that the reeds change uh, as you're making them. So the slower you make your reeds, the better the end result will be. Okay, we can see that that's starting to to, to soak in. So we can just put that along with our little collection of reeds.